Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Elliot Ruga. I'm the Policy and Communications Director of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Welcome to our continuing series of presentations and conversations about the natural and cultural resources of the New Jersey Highlands, a rich subject that I don't think we'll ever run out of topics. Tonight, we are talking about restoring native edible and medicinal plants. And I'd like to welcome back Jared Rosenbaum, who, who was our guest back in July when he spoke to us about creating meadows. Tonight, we'll learn about integrating native edible and medicinal, medicinal plants into ecological restoration of parks and farms to create habitats that support human life as well as other critters. Jared is a botanist, a native, a native plant grower, and ecology and ecological restoration practitioner. He is a founding partner of Wild Ridge Plants LLC, a business that grows local ecotype nat native plants using sustainable practices. Jared is a certified ecological restoration practitioner by the Society for Ecological Restoration. His extensive, his extensive experience in stewardship and monitoring of natural communities enable him to perform botanical surveys and provide ecological restoration planning services. He is known as an educator in plant ecology, ecological restoration, and the cultural uses of wild plant foods and medicine. Jared is the author of two books on native plants, including the children's book, the Puddle Garden. Jared, welcome back to the last time we saw you. We were sort of going into hibernation and now we're coming out. Yeah, thanks a lot, Elliot. And thanks everybody for braving this crazy windy day to join us. It was a little bit of a harrowing drive here, but I made it. Well, I guess some of you are joining from farther away. I don't know if it's crazy windy by you, but up here on the side of a mountain in Pohakon, New Jersey, I was just waiting for a tree to crash down on one of the cars or the sheds or the greenhouses or the greenhouses to lift up and fly away and journey to Oz. So it looks like that hasn't happened, nor has my internet connection been destroyed. So thanks again for joining me. I wish we really were in person. About a decade ago, someone wrote a book about the island where I grew up. They described 30 species of orchids, glacial bogs, giant tulip tree forests along its steep sloping shores. And this remembrance of my childhood island really brought a tear to my eye because the island where I grew up is Manhattan and the natural habitats described in the book were from 400 years ago. This is that book. We all live in habitats. Some of us live in habitats that are buried beneath pavement. Some in habitats diminished by centuries of intensive land use. And some of us have yards and farms that contain remnant habitats of exceptional quality. The project we're working on together is restoring our habitats right where we live, work, and play, not as museum pieces, but as vital sustaining elements of our lives, livelihoods, and life ways. We're getting pretty good at creating gardens and habitat for wildlife, but we've left out one very important species ourselves. The premise of my talk tonight is that using, restoring, native, edible, medicinal, cultural plant species is fundamental to healing habitats and also to healing our connection with those habitats, whether they're the habitats underneath our pavement, in our backyards, in our lawns, or in more intact natural areas. So 
when I give a presentation, it's often because I'm asking myself a series of questions. And I don't always feel like I have all the answers to them. But what makes doing something like this exciting is to be able to explore ideas together with you. And so that this is not just a crazy jumble of my thoughts. Here's a little bit of a roadmap to how we will proceed tonight. First, I'm going to talk about food systems. Then we'll move on to human connection and reconnecting to natural habitats and to native plants. And finally, we'll bring those two branches together and discuss restoring our habitats using native edible and medicinal wild plants. We'll start on food systems. To bring a little bit of context to what I've been thinking through, I want to talk a little bit about land use history in our region. And what we're looking at here on the slides are two images from the Harvard Forest dioramas. And so these are sort of famous depictions of land use change in New England, starting with that pre-European invasion forest that you see on the left. And I guess uh, pressing, as it were, towards that image of 1830s New England. And in many ways, what we see in those images is a project of trying to take the new world and turn it into the old world. And we see that even in our names like New England or New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire. This effort to take this completely really alien continent and make it look like, well, kind of like the Shire over there in the 1830s, quote unquote, New England. One of the predominant forces erasing the pre-European habitat is and was agriculture. For several hundred years, people have been laboring to turn North America into Europe. Our soils have been flattened, plowed, amended, drained. We use Eurasian livestock, Eurasian food plants, and Eurasian farming practices. And I'd even venture to speculate, when you amend a field or pasture livestock that are Eurasian, amend a field with their manure, and they're being fed like Eurasian grasses, orchard grass, or timothy, and it's being processed through their own internal biome, I would venture to speculate that that has a profound effect on our native soil biome, because in a way, the digestive processes in the stomach and in the soil and in the land are cognate to one another. But of course, that's speculation. What we do see is that when farmland reverts, a process that was especially significant during the 20th century and engendered lots of theories about succession because so much farmland was turning back to what we would talk about as, I guess, a natural or a wild place. It's no wonder that that reverting farmland often becomes a haven for Eurasian plant species, whether it's multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, shrub honeysuckle, oriental bittersweet, or so on. All the problematic invasive species of the sort of successional process as these places are attempting to rewild into something maybe approaching a natural habitat. Part of the question that I want to ask tonight is, can we do better? Can we repair these degraded landscapes and find less damaging ways to obtain our food? Can we honor the new world in a way without trying to turn it into the old world? Okay, massive generalization time, forgive me. But if we were to divide up the ways that human beings have obtained food I think maybe we could put them in two very broad camps. Agriculture, which spans maybe the last 10,000 years, give or take. And 
what we could call the hunter gatherer or eco culture lifestyle, eco culture, borrowing that phrase from Forge or Sam, Sam Thayer, I think it's very apt. And hunter gatherer, we can put back at least 200,000 years. I mean, this is sort of like, where do you place the beginnings of Homo sapiens that keeps getting pushed back? Um, certainly aspects of the hunter gatherer lifestyle go even before that. So this is something with quite a heritage in our species history. And if we're to look at each of them, when we talk about agriculture, there are a lot of problematic aspects of agriculture relative to the environment, relative to natural habitats, relative to native plants. And this is just a smattering of statistics. I think one of the signal statistics up there is the top one, that 40% of the terrestrial surface of the earth is now given over to agriculture. But we also see impacts on water consumption, on greenhouse gas emissions, on soil destruction and erosion, on air pollution. And of course, I mean, you know, this kind of statistical list could go on forever. But I'll leave it at that because most importantly, agriculture by its very nature replaces natural habitats and it fosters disconnection. Aspects of nature that are able to persist and impose themselves into an agricultural context are usually thought of as pests or plagues or maladies of one kind or another. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in a relationship of animosity with just about any creature or plant that is not our desired crop or life, livestock species. I want to talk about hunter gatherers. And again, I'm painting with such broad brush strokes here, and I'm really hesitant to oversimplify 200,000 years of cultural history, or even, you know, forgive me, um, any of the indigenous groups that I might mention here. But one of the things about the hunter gatherer lifestyle is it takes place within fully functional ecosystems. It has many expressions that are responsive to local habitats. Culture reflects the local ecology in really foundational ways. And if we were to take one angle, let's say, of looking at this and look at dietary diversity based on the number of food plants, you can see from this list here among the Hausa, 119 food plants among the Kung, 85, Tibetan indigenous, 168 food plants, the Cherokee, over 80, probably well over 80. And then at the bottom of this list, we've got contemporary American. And, you know, there's 30 plants listed there. But if you think about it, it's probably even less than that, because we're not talking about like different cultigens of essentially the same species, like all the different brassicas, you know, broccolis and mustards and I don't know, kales and you know what I mean, right? I don't know anything about this plant stuff. Um, even Manhattan, so Manhattan before 400 years ago, with its, you know, 55 different habitat types and 30 species of native orchids, was inhabited by a hunter-gatherer group, the Lenny Lenape. And again, I don't want to oversimplify anybody's lifestyle, but I think this is relevant. Now, some people will problematize the hunter-gatherer lifestyle and they'll say, well, you know, it's associated with a large nomadic range. It requires a low population density. And those are problems. Those sound like immense benefits to me. So that's my, uh, that's my attempt to put a little bit of a historical context and just get you all in the frame about thinking in broad brush strokes about the impacts of our food systems and the different ways in which food systems have been configured over our cultural history as a species. I like to say that for hunter gatherers, food diversity equals biodiversity and biodiversity equals food diversity. And so it is important to not uh, be profound ecosystem disruptors, but instead to 
be ecosystem managers in a more beneficial way. And that's what we'll be talking about. Next up, talking about human connection. What would it be like to be in that kind of intimate, diverse relationship with wild plants, with our food plants and our ecosystem from which we gather our sustenance. So in this classic optical illusion, you can see either in dark two faces, or perhaps you see a goblet in white in the center. And I'd venture to say that so much of Western thought is focused on those two individuals, rather than on the relationship between them. Much of our science has been about dissecting and categorizing, taxonomizing the individual parts, breaking things down to the smallest possible particle size. And ecology may be radical because it reorients us towards relationships, towards that goblet instead. Or here's another version of the same picture, but this one features hummingbird and cardinal flower. And if you look at hummingbird, hummingbird is putting its bill deep into the red tubular floral corolla of that, col of that cardinal flower. And meanwhile, what is cardinal flower doing? Well, if you look on the back of hummingbird's head, cardinal flower's anthers are depositing a little bit of pollen on the back of hummingbird's head. And look how those two forms, that animal form, that plant form, are like mirror or inverse images of each other. Look how co-evolved they are. They fit perfectly together. And without hummingbird, Cardinal flower is weird. It's grotesque. It's monstrous. I mean, don't get me wrong. Cardinal flower is a beautiful wildflower. But its whole shape, its whole anatomy is geared towards the presence of hummingbirds. You couldn't have this plant in Europe because there's no Eurasian hummingbirds. And by the same token, hummingbirds are kind of weird if you don't have long tubular flower corollas with a nice sweet nectar reward right at the base of them for that oddly levitating bill to seek out. Species that are removed from their ecological relationships, from their contexts, can become monstrous. They can become grotesque. And that is what has happened to us. What does, oops, sorry about that. What, what is a broken or grotesque relationship in ecology? It looks like missing soil and missing soil organisms, missing pollinators missing plants, missing predators, and that all equals degraded habitats. Of course, the most broken relationship of all is that of ours with the rest of the natural world. And I have some statistics up here because that's the obligatory thing to do when you give a presentation, but it's that first one that really breaks my heart. Children average seven minutes outdoors a day. That's about enough time to get off the school bus, take out the papers in the trash, yakety yak, don't talk back. And that's about it, and they're inside. I wanna to talk to you about a native edible plant. I wanna to talk to you about a story of connection through wild plants. The image on the left is a skillet cooked over a fire with milkweed tops, the tops of common milkweed. 
and they're, if I remember right, they're fried up with some kind of wild onion. Maybe it was ramps. Maybe it was not in wild onion. Some maple syrup, some sea salt from, I think I boiled it down from the Outer Banks. All cooked over an open fire and really, really hearty, delicious vegetable. In the center there, I've got some lacto-fermented milkweed tops. So again, milkweed tops kind of like the broccoli phase, like the flower buds haven't opened yet, but they're there and they're plump. They're kind of meaty. And I, I have to admit, I was kind of proud of myself when I did this lacto-fermented milkweed tops. And I put it up on social media. This is a while back. And I was kind of patting myself on the back. Like, oh, look at me. And uh, somebody I know in the conservation scene who I really like and have a lot of respect for was like, I prefer to keep my milkweed for the monarch butterflies. And I was like, ooh. And of course, you know, I wanted to retort in some way, but I don't really like, you know, getting into... Uh, squabbles on social media and prefer to have a different social life than that although now i guess my entire social life is social media but back then in the wonderful old days it just kind of signed off so you know i didn't want to tell her off on social media so i'm going to tell her off now to all of you instead um you know if all of us who plant kale or tomatoes or basil also planted common milkweed Imagine how much more common milkweed there would be around for us and for the monarch caterpillars who are dependent on it as their larval food source. We would be breaking bread with the monarchs. We would be sharing sustenance together. And what brings you closer to another being than sharing a meal with them? Imagine what all that extra milkweed would do to create corridors for monarchs, even if, yeah, once in a while we make some pickles or fry some up in a skillet. Sure, but that's a robust plant. There's enough to go around. What if we see people in relationship with wild plants? What does that look like? Luckily, on our continent, we don't have to look too far. We have a rich indigenous tradition of people in relationship with native wildflowers, with native trees, with native shrubs. And one of the best books on this subject is from California. I think it's widely applicable. It's a great book called Tend in the Wild by M. Cat Anderson. And she talks about the indigenous land management practices of native Californians their sophisticated, complex harvesting and management practices that created more food, more medicine, more fiber, more plants for humans and for wildlife, and that most of the plant communities in California were influenced in varying degree by native management. And those early settlers who may have described these habitats or even early conservationists like John Muir may not have been able to perceive the native impact on those landscapes because they were coming from a place where they didn't have a framework for that. Uh, you know, within the Eurasian tradition, they didn't have a land management practice necessarily or at the forefront or the language to describe this really complex interdependence, interrelationship with what we continue to describe as wild habitats, but are really something else that we don't have good words for. Something reciprocal, something interdependent, something like an eco-culture. Another book. I just have like generic superlatives for this book. I wish I could get you into this book. Maybe some of you have read it, but this is just the best book I've ever read about plants. It blew me away. If I was a much, much, much better human being, this is the book that I would have written or would have would aspire to write. This is um, just this incredible braiding together of different traditions and perceptions about wild plants. What I want to talk about from this book, Braiding Streetgrass, is 
a series of experiments that they did. So Robin Kimmer is a professor in upstate New York. A series of experiments that she did with her graduate students related to sweetgrass, which is a native grass species that is used um, ceremonially and in craft, or maybe the two are intertwined. And in the first one, one of her graduate students sets up an experiment co comparing traditional harvesting methods for sweetgrass against a control plot where no harvesting takes place. And I guess the idea here and the kind of feedback that they were getting from the outside world was, uh, oh, you know, this is harvesting this increasingly rare species is deleterious to its populations and is contributing to its disappearance. Well, lo and behold, the control plot where they did nothing withered away, disappeared, and the harvested plots were thriving. Another thing in the book that was related is they did some mapping of contemporary and historic populations of sweetgrass. Uh, blue dots where there used to be sweetgrass and has since disappeared. Red dots marking places where stillgrass was, uh, excuse me, not stillgrass, sweetgrass was still extant. And um, turns out that the red dots representing persisting populations of sweetgrass were clustered around native communities particularly those known for their sweetgrass basketry. Sweetgrass was thriving where it is used and disappearing everywhere else. So when people leave the natural world, when we go to occupy our technological bubble, our agricultural bubble, our urban bubbles, sweetgrass leaves also. And in the course of doing botanical survey work over you know, well over 10,000 acres, I'm always looking for these plants, for these cultural plants, for edible and medicinal plants, and often asking myself, why are these species waning? Why are they disappearing? And again, I would speculate that there are many species like sweetgrass that are actually missing our presence as members of the ecosystem. We're like wolves or buffalo we're keystone species. We need to be here for our habitats. So tending and harvesting native food plants is a powerful way of connecting people to natural habitats. It has been traditionally. It continues to be a way to really attract people to become more interested in wild plants. But we have an enormous population density I'm not sure that our existing intact wild habitats could sustain the pressure of our learning curve in regard to becoming good harvesters of these native medicinal and edible plants, many of which are on the wane. Perhaps those natives, whenever they arrived in California, had a learning curve also relative to the wild habitats and learning techniques for tending and management that increased diversity and increased productivity. Yes, but what I already said. And that leads me to restoring our habitats. Those intact habitats that are full of your black cohoshes or blue cohoshes or bloodroots and ginsengs and all those you know, golden seals, semi-legendary medicinal plants of the great eastern woodlands, those can be our model. Those can be our reference ecosystems. But maybe there's not enough wild around, especially in New Jersey, for everyone to tend but we have many degraded habitats, lawns, blighted urban areas, farms, parks, some really destroyed stream sides. We can use intact habitats as a model to find vast, you know, find these areas of land that could support more intact relationships. 
And that brings me to the idea, one of the ideas at the heart of ecological restoration, I think one of the things that really attracts me to ecological restoration practice is this thought, and here you have a little quote from the Society for Ecological Restoration describing it, but basically a reference ecosystem or a reference site in order to create long lasting successful restorations that fit the land that we're working with we need to consider what are appropriate plants what kind of composition what kind of structure what are the relationships right and one of the things that we can do is seek out more intact habitats that resemble in certain fundamental ways the degraded habitat that we're trying to heal, that we're trying to repair. And those more intact ecosystems are called reference ecosystems or reference sites or reference communities. And our observations of those sites can be scientific. They can be quantitative. They can also be subjective. They can be perceptual. They can utilize all of our animal sensory apparatus. They can be narrative. We can tell stories. They can be robust in a human way. And I think that's one of the things that attracts me to the idea of the reference ecosystem. There's only so much you can garner with a plant list or a spreadsheet of quantitative data, but there's so much that we can perceive by going to these more intact sites and looking at all the relationships that are inherent there. So we've got to ask ourselves a question, some questions. What does an intact native habitat look like? But also, what food plants does it contain? And we're just asking everybody here to go and eat a bunch of semi-palatable famine foods. So I want to take you on a trip. And our first destination is our reference site Dyberry Creek, Pennsylvania, nearby. We took a family vacation up here, maybe half decade ago or so. It was a family reunion. Somebody rented this really nice kind of like log cabin, and we were exploring. This is in the Endless Mountains area of Pennsylvania, and it was just really intact and beautiful. I mean, the picture you're seeing here, that's all just Joe Pye weed along the sunny, moist bend in the stream corridor. Really beautiful place, and you know, I'd venture to say that the same creek in New Jersey might have mugwort there instead or Japanese knotweed, but this place was just chock-a-block full of native herbaceous diversity. We actually went there because I was looking to try to find what the habitat, what the native habitat, what the reference ecosystem, I guess, for bee bomb, Menarda didyma is. Bee bomb is an endangered species in New Jersey. There's, you know, some localized occurrences of it. It becomes more frequent as you move into the Appalachian and Montane areas. And so was we found a number of occurrences in that area of Pennsylvania. And it helped me to just understand as a restoration practitioner, as a botanist, as a native plant grower who grows this plant, who really loves this plant, like where does this plant actually grow? This is not like a meadow species per se. Bee balm was a species of kind of like moist, sunny streamside thickets, and you're just as likely to see it with wild yam root and spice bush as together with, I don't know, a moist meadow plant, Indian grass or something like that. This is almost a plant that's uh, transitional between what I would think of as a woodland plant and think of as a meadow plant. It occupies this other space, which I think a creek really exemplifies. It is this transitional zone, and there's areas of abundant moisture, fertility, and sunshine, often areas along bends and cobbles and banks where there are less trees, and of course the sunshine emanating from the corridor of the creek or river itself. The cool thing about Dyberry Creek was you approach it from the shade and you're walking through trilliums and blue cohosh and wild leeks, orchids, and wild ginger and Virginia water leaf and this suite of just really nice forest herbaceous species. And then you get to where the trees give away to the banks and cobbles on the side of the stream. And all of a sudden you're in cardinal flower and boneset and elderberry and bee balm and joe pie weed and tall cone flower. And it was just, just a stunning spot. 
So I took some casual notes there, and this is the plant list from those casual notes. And the question I want to ask looking at this plant list is, which of these are native edible species? So first, we're going to excise the non-native species here, not because they're not relevant ecologically, and not because some of them aren't edibles, but because we're asking a specific question tonight about restoring native edible and medicinal plant species. So here's our excised list, and here's some of the native edible and medicinal species featured. And, you know, I got to say that um, these are maybe the top species in here, because there's actually a lot of other species here that are edible or medicinal in some ways. I mean, red maple, maybe the syrup, some people use alder medicinally, jewelweed certainly, big leaf aster has edible foliage, the goldenrods you can make into teas, people eat trilliums or theoretically would. Um, so there's more edibles here, but I just want to have a little look at some of my favorites from among this list. And I got to say, I'm not going to go into enough detail here where I feel comfortable saying like, Oh, run with this. You have everything you need to know about identification, harvesting, preparation, and, um, you know, responsible use. But let this be a teaser. For some of you, this will be familiar territory. And if this is new, I hope that this is enticing. The first and very enticing species is wild leek up there at the top. Some people know of it as ramps, the gourmet wild onion, kind of garlicky onion. People use the bulb or more sustainably the foliage. There are great big ramps festivals. Um, this is a really, really um, highly flavorful spring herb, vegetable. I don't know what you'd call it, allium. The next species I touched on already a little bit, common milkweed, and this is one you should research for yourself because some people talk about toxicity in regard to this species, but there are preparation steps. This is probably the vegetable that I can think of with the longest like seasonal time span of harvestability. And the only thing in my garden that maybe I harvest for longer than this is like sun gold tomatoes. Um, but as a vegetable, you can eat the early shoots like asparagus. You can eat the tops like broccoli before they um, blossom. And you can eat that young seed pod, you know, the one that's going to have all those wishies in it. When it's still young and kind of um, not fully formed, that's its okra phase. So this is sort of like an asparagus with a broccoli with an okra all in one plant. And that takes you through a good part of the season, yellow birch. Yellow birch and black birch, which I'll actually feature later. Uh, these are some of my favorite wild teas. I usually just snip a couple twigs and put it in water past the boil. And it'll turn kind of peachy pinkish and have this wintergreen aroma. Really wonderful tea. It does have some medicinal attributes because um, that same wintergreen quality in there also has pain relieving constituents. Um, it's a natural toothbrush. You can chew on a twig, fray the ends, and not only does it have a wintergreen flavor, it also has xylitol in it, just like a bunch of your sort of, I don't know, high-end health food store toothpastes. And uh, it's not made out of plastic. It's probably even better for you than a plastic toothbrush with crest on it. Go figure. You can also make a syrup out of the birches, kind of like a maple syrup. Blue cohosh has medicinal attributes largely pertaining to pregnancy and birthing. Boneset is one of our preeminent native antivirals and febrifuges. Virginia water leaf is a good spring cooked green. Wood nettle is maybe the tastiest cooked wild green that I can think of in our flora with a really long harvest period, very nutritive, very meaty tasting. Um, you have to prepare it correctly because it does have stinging hairs on it, just like stinging nettle, and we will get to stinging nettle in a moment as well. Ostrich fern, those of you who have eaten fiddleheads, this is the fern that you're eating fiddleheads from, so another kind of spring gourmet food. Imagine some wild leek and ostrich fern and some wild trout. That's a dynamite wild foods meal from our ecosystem. A couple more. That bee balm has an aroma like rose 
citrus, oregano put together it makes a really nice stomach soothing tea. And hey, you could sprinkle it on your pizza or put it in your salad. Actually, if you go and browse on those red tubular Corollas, yep, this is a hummingbird plant, you will find the same sweet sugary reward at the end of those flower petals that the hummingbird does. And you know, my my 10 year old kid will just go when this blooms and just graze around like I don't know, like an ungulate on this stuff. And so do I. It is delicious and sweet. Tall cone flower. This is an early spring cooked green. Elderberry, many of you may know, also has antiviral properties. Tea, syrup, jelly. Make a syrup, put it on your waffles. Basswood. Basswood is a tree and it has edible foliage. And it's only edible for a short period of time when the leaves are newly emerged, but that's a whole freaking tree of salad. It also has flowers that make a really nice, soothing, nerving tea. Hemlock, likewise, a very delicious wild tea that really evokes the north woods for me. And great nettle, Urtica dioica subspecies gracilis. This is our native stinging nettle. And like all the other stinging nettles, extremely nutritive, very high in protein. Maybe the closest you can come to meat with a vegetable. I kind of almost think of it as like a seaweed of the land. A lot of times herbalists will use this when um, attempting to support different body systems like in convalescence. This is a great soup, a great tea, a great dehydrated herb for the winter when we're getting less good quality greens. So... You know, clearly these riparian corridors, these riverways, these streamways have a lot of plants that can offer us something, but what could we give back to a stream corridor? If we saw ourselves in relationship or reciprocal with this kind of habitat, what can we offer back? Well, first of all, so many of our bottomland habitats are heavily disturbed, first by agricultural conversion, by hydrological changes, by industry. These areas are ripe for, desperate for restoration. Some of these no longer have the original plant species that it might have been there. A lot of them have become very weedy, full of your oriental bittersweets or your mugworts or your knotweeds or your lesser celandines or, you know, just about anything that likes a nice, moist, rich, fertile soil that is heavily disturbed, that is often um, becomes a bare soil in like a flooding event, is going to like a riparian corridor. So these are areas that we can augment with plantings of native plants. Those ramps we talked about earlier they don't disperse very far as a wild plant. They have these little black round seeds and maybe the seed rolls downhill a little bit or maybe it gets its way into some water and rolls down river a bit. But this is not a species that's crossing Route 95 anytime soon or even making its way across a golf course. But this is a species that is hard to grow horticulturally. It takes two years to germinate and in my experience, Experience growing it in the nursery the first three years or so it looks like kind of like a blade of grass um, it's a slow grower but if you sprinkle ramp seeds around in a good fertile soil or really actually kind of almost anywhere they germinate pretty reliably so we can bring this species back to all those riparian corridors that it's been removed from or excised from by historical land use and disturbance and it's even deer resistant, which brings me to deer. You know, these and much of the rest of the Northeast are deer ravaged habitats. And maybe one of the most important things we can do is eat our wild edibles, eat some of the weedy non-native wild edibles and have some venison with it. The plant people need you to eat deer, even the vegetarians. Is that okay to say? No. Probably not, but I mean it. If you want to help out the plants, there needs to be less deer and either we're bringing wolves back or we need to be the wolves ourselves. Lest you think that the only, oops, 
you know, really food plant rich habitat is these fertile bottomlands. I'm going to go in the opposite direction and take you up to the glacially scoured ridgelines of Pyramid Mountain, natural historic area, which is in Morris County, New Jersey. I did botanical survey work here. Um, you know, four, five, six years ago. Beautiful place. I'm going to take you up to Pyramid Mountain itself, which has been glacially scoured down to very thin soils, has not accumulated much since then. The soils are derived from felsic rocks, so um, feldspar, silica, rich, quartz-rich rock that is not very rich in plant nutrients granites and gneisses. Um, so it's generative of poor soils. So really like the opposite end of the spe spectrum from Dyberry Creek back there. And here's a little sneak preview photographically of some of the species up there on Pyramid Mountain. Beautiful place. Here's our plant list. This is just a subsection of Pyramid Mountain. That's kind of like a little overlook area there. And there's actually not any non-native plants here. This is a and which is not to say that there aren't any at Pyramid Mountain, but just in this area. This is a challenging habitat. This is an acidic, poor, dry soil. Granite rock that's exposed can probably heat up to 120, 130 degrees on a hot summer day. Um, this is a really xeric habitat as far as New Jersey goes. And so we don't have to excise any non-natives here to drill down to our edible natives. But Here's some of our edible natives highlighted. Again, just curating some of the more choice stuff. We could talk about native grasses and using the seeds. And again, that red maple there and native roses that are in here that aren't highlighted. But let's just talk about some really good stuff. So if that stream corridor is the breadbasket, maybe that's a really inept metaphor, but um, this would be the trail mix maybe fruits and nuts um up there on the ridge is a really sunny habitat trees can be sparse they're kind of thrawn and eccentric they're they're all curved and uh you know sort of wind thrown and that leaves a lot of room for fruiting shrubs and for herbaceous plants as well potentially so we've got service berry up there which is kind of like a on the cherry, apple, almond end of the spectrum, if you've never had them, they're also called June berries. They fruit out in June. They're absolutely delicious. I don't think you can find them in any stores. Um, my wife, Rachel, once said, this is as good as a cherry, and that is pretty high praise. Black chokeberry, on the other hand, is not as good as a raw fruit, but makes a really exceptional juice and is widely considered to be a superfood. Black birch, we kind of already talked about the birches, but pretty much my favorite wild tea. Black huckleberry. Uh, a lot of people don't really differentiate between huckleberry and wild blueberries. I like huckleberries even more than wild blueberries, and that is saying a lot. Bristly dewberry, the dewberries, which are like a creeping blackberry species. The dewberries up on Pyramid Mountain are really... Uh, ripe and robust and sweet and they're just plump. Lowbush blueberry, probably enough said. Um, another wild blueberry species, very delicious. Indian cucumber root, that root actually tastes like a cool, crisp cucumber. Very remarkable. Probably susceptible to over-harvesting, but worth trying once in your lifetime. Solomon seals, these are kind of like, these are shoots shoot vegetables so when they're first emerging in the spring out of the ground and the leaves are still clasped at the top almost like a like a tulip or something these are monocots these are kind of like asparagus without the asparagus you know what i mean like that funky smell after you eat asparagus um these are sweet and crisp and meaty and they don't have that somewhat weird aroma not to diss on asparagus i like asparagus plenty much couple more black cherry this has good fruits if you've had black cherry soda that is actually derived not from the fruit but from the bark of the black cherry although it's probably derived from artificial flavorings now but black cherry was once an important antitussive or cough medicine flavor and you can still get your black cherry cough drops whether or not they're actually from black cherry bark i don't know oaks so you might be asking, like, how are we going to replace, uh, you know, wheat flour or, I don't know, hydrolyzed soy protein or something 
yummy like that. And um, I don't really know about the hydrolyzed soy protein, but if we're talking starches, high quality carbohydrates, um, oaks is the place where traditionally many of the different cultures of the world have looked for that baseline starch. Uh, we, when we first, so oaks require a little bit of processing. I'm not going to get deep into it, but when we first processed oat flour, we made some waffles. And uh, usually I'll eat some waffles, put some maple syrup on there, and it's really tasty. And then I'm like starving an hour later because I totally sugar crash. We made waffles with oak flour, oh, with acorn flour. I think it was a mix, but there's a substantial amount of acorn flour in there. And at like two o'clock in the afternoon, I was like, hey, you know, we, we never had lunch. And it was the weirdest feeling because I know that after eating regular waffles, I'd be starving. But there was something so sustaining about this acorn flour. People have this special, deep historical relationship with oak trees. And think about what a perennial long-lived oak tree means compared to like a monocrop of a cornfield or a wheat field. Sassafras, if you like root beer, you like sassafras, although it's illegal to buy or sell, so you got to get it yourself. We're not going to get into that today. Um, but if you can dig up some sassafras roots, it is like digging up the living original essence of root beer and is a life changing experience, or at least was for me. I just couldn't believe that this tree had the life-changing original essence of true root beer in it. Uh, it's also used in a variety of other ways, as a green, as a powdered soup thickener in gumbo filet. Last of all, black haw viburnum. This is kind of a weird fruit, maybe a little bit advanced level compared to something like a dewberry or a huckleberry. It tastes sort of like a combination between like a prune and oolong tea. I mean, that doesn't sound too good, but Rachel made a really good chocolate black haw cake. So this stuff has potential. You know, uh, as an aside, a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, these edible foods are kind of weird, or I don't know what to do with them, or I don't know what to do with the oaks. And it's true, like, we need to know how to prepare these foods. If somebody handed you a potato and was like, you know, two thirds of the world subsists on this food or whatever, and you bit into that potato, you'd be like, bro, what the fuck is wrong with you? This is nasty because we know how to take a raw. Can I say that? Sorry, Highlands Coalition. It is New Jersey, right? We can, we, we all curse, right? Um, where was I? Potatoes. You know, we know how to make potatoes into French fries and all kinds of good stuff. And that's true for wild foods too. But we need to understand that some of these foods require preparation in order to make them really good. And some of them are wonderful right off the tree, as it were. So this habitat, ridges, glades, open, sunny, thin soiled slopes. These are places that are often richest in diversity when ample sun reaches the ground. These are places that through leaf litter dep deposition can become dominated by trees or other woody plants over time and can be reliant on episodic disturbances, including human disturbances, to encourage heterogeneity, to encourage that ground lever layer vegetation to be really robust, to make sure that those low bush blueberries and huckleberries actually fruit because there are a lot of huckleberries and blueberries in New Jersey underneath, you know, chestnut oak forests. And one seldom finds ample fruit in those areas. You go up onto these sunny ridgelines where trees are only growing in like cracks in the bedrock and they're all twisted and gnarled. And those are the places to find sweet ripe fruits. These are places that historically were one, probably most susceptible to wildfire, and two, probably most susceptible to Native American set fires, to the cultural use of fire. These are places that still are dependent on fire to maintain that diversity, that heterogeneity, to do some coppicing and thinning. And of course, we can do coppicing and thinning 
in these habitats ourselves, I'm hesitant to suggest that we should do these on a large scale level mechanically as part of a timber harvest. That doesn't mean we can't say, look at this patch of Solomon seals here. Maybe if I trim this overhanging branch, this will become an even more robust patch over time because it's that detailed spot by spot, species by species immersion that I think is demanded of us as land managers. And I think that's the cool thing about going and harvesting food plants because you're really looking, you're really paying attention. You're like, I don't want to eat something poisonous here. I don't want to dig up the wrong root. Becoming a forager is a really good incentive to become a good botanist. And it also is going to make you look around and you're like, oh, this, you know, invasive weed is about to overtake my prime food or medicine patch. You might do some tending there, or maybe that invasive weed is edible also, and it might end up in the pot along with whatever you originally came there to harvest and some venison. Um, this is a place where we don't want to enrich the soil. This is a place where we may need to do seeding rather than planting in some cases, because this is a really shallow soil. This is thin. This is drought prone. This is the kind of place where maybe we can introduce some edible native annuals. Those California natives after burns would introduce chinopodium plants. So um, maybe the most well-known wild edible for that would be lamb's quarters, which is frequently a Eurasian plant, although there's a native lamb's quarters, but there's a host of native chinopo chinopods. And uh, these are native annuals that sow into disturbed soils, into burned over soils, and provide a flush of cover and food plants. And these are the kind of nuances that as land managers and foragers that we can get to understand as we immerse ourselves in this kind of restoration practice. So what are the key ingredients in our land cookbook? How did Manahata have ample food, but also 30 species of orchids and 55 different natural habitat types and old growth forests of tulip trees running down its slopes to the river. Well, one, I think we need to focus on degraded areas. We can't just go and over harvest the last intact or relatively intact remnants in our area. We need to use locally appropriate native species modeled on real habitat types. And I guess this is time for another digression. Why native? One of the things that bothers me is when people conflate the desire to restore native plants with some kind of like chauvinism or um, like anti-immigrant feeling. And I'm going to try to parse this for you and I hope I don't mess it up. But the thing about native plants is they're dependent on native habitats to persist. If you take away native habitats, as we have done in a widespread fashion, these native plants don't have anywhere else to go. They're not like necessarily invasive, generalist, non-native weeds who can, you know, they have their home territory already. So they are not a conservation priority. Japanese non-weed is not a conservation priority, but wild leeks could be. Hapata could, could be, black cohosh could be, because they're native species. And I think that this is different from sort of uh, political reactionary nationalism where we say, uh, you know, we don't like people from such and such country or whatever, because those are based around political boundaries. And sorry, but political boundaries are not really meaningful to plants or wildlife. They're highly historically contingent and arbitrary. And like saying that an invasive plant is problematic for a native ecosystem, I don't think is the same thing as saying we don't like humans of a certain nationality. Anyway, I hope that hit, hits home in some way because the last thing I want is for the native plant movement to be associated with, um, with chauvinism. These plants need our help and not to be um, sort of overly metaphorized into this awkward relationship with political boundaries. Anyway, end of digression. Maybe we can weight our restoration species towards edible and medicinal species and welcome ourselves back into the picture in this way. Maybe we can meld the need for long-term maintenance 
with the interests of long-term harvesters and long-term caretakers. And we'll get more into that in a moment. Maybe we can decrease our alienation by designing natural communities in which we belong as wild creatures, as beneficial components, not just as bad actors, not just as destroyers and pillagers. So who is this for? Here's three simple groups of people for whom I think this presentation may be relevant. I think a lot about farmers. A lot of my friends are young, progressive, organic farmers doing their darndest to um, reform our food system. And I bring this to them not by way of critique, but as an offering. What if farmers, instead of converting habitats, instead of needing to maybe erase hedgerows, needing to convert marginal land, what if they could leave them in their natural state? What if they could augment the farm with native plantings that are ecologically functional, control erosion, build soils, welcome in pollinators and beneficial insects, and are also a valuable crop? And hey, maybe a valuable crop that you're not going to be outcompeted on from another continent, but something very specific to our bioregion, to our soils, to our climate. Young people who want to become farmers are buying really marginal pieces of land because so much of our prime farmland in New Jersey has been developed or is just so expensive. And you can level and till and drain and try to turn the new world into the old world. Or maybe you can work with the plant communities and the habitats that are already there. What about restoration practitioners? One of the things that I found so frustrating when I worked for a nonprofit getting stewardship grants was they'd be for like a year or two. And how can you do a restoration project in a year or two? I mean, these are probably lifetime or beyond the sort of human lifetime frame projects. In a year, I want to do baseline monitoring. I want to know what's there. I want to look at reference communities. I don't want to just dive in and start making changes. I want to make sure I'm doing less harm than good. And I want to be able to say 10 years later, like, this is what changed because we did quality baseline monitoring before we changed anything. And if we made mistakes, which of course, restoration is a young art, we're figuring this out. We need to be able to communicate this with each other. We can't do restoration projects as a one-off and like, oh, we got this grant for some spring plantings. Boom. All right, done. That really bothers me. We need to allocate somehow for long-term maintenance of restored habitats. What if your land steward retires? Nobody remembers. What if that great volunteer moves away? We need to figure out ways to get the wider community more involved. You know, one of the things I've noticed giving presentations about wild edible and medicinal plants is I get different people come into those hikes to those classes. I see young people. I see people from different ethnic communities. All right. So if I give a presentation on like beautiful native perennials or uh, butterfly gardens, I get a certain group of people and a wonderful group of people who I would just say are largely in the over 55 set. And hey, I'm on my way there myself. No diss. You guys know something that sometimes the younger people don't know about gardening, about attachment to the natural world. We need to figure out a way to get a wider, a younger, a more diverse community involved. Maybe there are people from ethnic communities that came from roots that utilized wild plants, but they need a bridge to the flora of the Northeast. You could have, as a land steward, the most dynamite community potluck where you all have tended this wild plant landscape, you've weeded, you've planted, and then once a year, you all go and harvest like the most exceptional and unique gourmet wild foods. You all try out new recipes. It would be so much fun. It would be so interesting to different people in the community. 
And I think that's how we generate long-term community involvement in our restored habitats, by bringing human beings back into picture in a fundamental way. What about gardeners? I think we gardeners are the avant-garde for the restoration movement. I think we're the laboratory for all of this. Sure, as a restoration practitioner, you get to try out a lot of cool stuff. But if you're a gardener, you are experimenting on a human scale with bee balm, with serviceberry, with wood nettle. How do you plant it? Who do you plant it with? If you wanted to seed it, does it work from seed? How do you harvest it? What's the seasonality? What are preparation methods? These are things that all of us gardeners are really well suited to figure out because we're already growing food plants in our gardens. We're already growing perennials in our gardens. So much of the culture, the lore, the preparation, the basic human understanding of these species is lost. So much of that Native American culture is either gone or at least not in the common conversation but we can create new culture around these plants. We can inform restoration practice and farming as gardeners. Here's a picture of a part of a farm that I did a restoration project on, sort of a before and after, if you will. Think about what a huge system agriculture is. That 40% of the terrestrial service of the earth is in agriculture. If we can affect even a small percentage of this land usage, we're making a huge impact in terms of native plant habitat, wildlife habitat, ecological function. I was a couple years back visited the Pine Barrens with a friend of mine and we were driving back and we were talking, you know, environmental disaster statistics. This is a kind of conversation that we have, I guess. And my friend who was more eager to indulge in such things than I was, was rattling off something about, you know, over the next X many years, X, you know, 50 to 75% of species will be gone or whatever, you know, extinction level event stuff. And I just rolled down the window and I was like, Hey, you know, look out the window this woodlot that we're passing, it already lost 50 to 75% of its species. And nobody noticed. Nobody cares. We can't just have statistics. We can't just have doomsday scenarios. We need a reason to care. We need to overcome this great forgetting about our involvement in natural habitats, that we are wildlife. We need to find our habitat again. We're wildlife species too, and in sundering ourselves from the wild world, we've done ourselves a disservice and a disservice to the rest of nature as well. Thank you very much for sticking with me tonight. You can reach me at jared at wildridgeplants.com. You can find Wild Ridge Plants at wildridgeplants.com for our native plant nursery there. We grow a lot of native species, including edible and medicinal and many other restoration plants. You can find my podcast and blog at Wild Plant Culture. Wild Plant Culture on Facebook and Instagram. Basically, I'm inviting you to be part of this conversation because we're not together tonight. Even though uh, next up, we've got Q&A and a little bit of conversation. I hope that we can interact a little bit. So thank you so much for sticking with me tonight. And I hope that this is part of an ongoing conversation here. Thank you, Jared. That was very informative and a fresh, different perspective with, with some hope and uh, opportunity. Uh, before we start our conversation, I'd just like to plug a couple of uh, the New Jersey Highlands Coalition's upcoming events. Um, come learn about how uh, the DEP collects data to determine the health of our streams and test your knowledge of benthic macroinvertebrates. It's Stream Assessment 101 with New Jersey's Watershed Ambassadors on April 8th. That's a webinar. Uh, I guess, Zach, if you put that link to register in the chat, that would be great. Um, and of course, this you can you can find this on our website under events and um, save the date for April 29th for a conversation with Joan Maloof, 
of the Old Growth Forest Network. And please subscribe to our email list or find us on social media for updates about all of our upcoming um, webinars. And also coming up on April 11th, we have a 75 mile car trek through the Highlands Core Forest. Learn about this, this, well, this 360 square mile intact forest we have improbably located in the more densely populated northern half of the most densely populated state that nobody knows about. Yet it's uh, ecological services and richness it provides us is incredible. That's on April 11th. And again, come to our website. You can find out more about that. And um, just a reminder that all of our webinars are available for streaming on our YouTube channel. So Jared, I have an opening question for you. Sure. We have, we have so many degraded landscapes here in New Jersey and even in the, in the Highlands whether it's privately owned land or on um, a park land. We have uh, forests with no tree regeneration, uh, carpeted with stilt grass and barberry and overrun by deer. These are, these, need, these are places that need restoration, but there's very little focus on them for that purpose. Um, can what you're talking about tonight be done on, on how large a scale can this be accomplished, given the will, the resources, and the time? You know, I often think to myself, like, the great weakness of New Jersey is how many people are here. It can be agonizing, right? And also the potential strength of our area is how many people are here. And so there are a lot of people out there and there's a lot of momentum and interest and excitement in the native plant movement. And I think that if we can, I think that there's an older branch of converse, of conservation, which is so important, which sort of put walls around our natural areas and protected places and said, don't mess with these places anymore, whether that's the national parks movement or nature preserves in the New Jersey Highlands. And sometimes I think to myself, this is like putting a cast on a broken leg. The first thing you need to do is immobilize it, make sure it doesn't get more broken, right? But you can't live with a cast forever. You need to move towards other steps in the healing process. And I think the next step in the healing process is how can we reintegrate this human strength that we have to do restoration on scale? So many of us are experimenting with this in our gardens and our yards, and how can we scale up? And this is one of the questions that I'm asking myself in putting this presentation together. Like what can draw people back into wild ecosystem in a way that transcends the sort of like even, again, and more power to this, but I'm going to go and watch birds and write down a list, or I'm going to hike up to the viewpoint. What is the next step in terms of being immersed and reciprocal with wild ecosystems so that we can really do this at scale so that people start looking at that crappy still grass woods behind their house or down the block or in the park, not as just an ecological disaster, which it is, but as potential. Oh, wow. I wonder what I could plant here, or I wonder what, with a little bit of tending, could come back in this place that would compel like my excitement over the long term and involve my community. Great. You know, it's it's ironic that so much of our institutional stewardship focus goes to our most intact. Uh, ecological healthy right. environments than the ones that really need uh, intervention. In some ways, maybe we need that, you know, we need our limited um, conservation expertise to really like focus on those extremely important rare species, rare habitats and so on. But the vast bulk of our natural area are not rare communities per se. And they need this sort of more mass involved, mass involvement. Well, we have some questions from the audience. They've been cool. Um, after have, having gone on a native plant buying spree uh -huh. and converted most of my yard into a native habitat, there are now many things popping up that 
I didn't plant and don't recognize. In spring, the yard looks like an exciting paradise. And by August, it's a jungle. How do I know what to weed? This is a tough question because I think the kind of question you want to give as a presenter is like a real nice, short, sweet soundbite, like, oh, sure, here's what you got to do. But I think that the answer to that question is a little bit longer. And I think it goes something like this. When you plant native plants in your yard or your garden or you create a meadow or something like that, like those plants become your babies and they become an invitation to really get to know them. And at first, it's a sort of very confusing process because what do you look at and how do you know when they're all green and they look similar? And I think over time we get to a place where the same way we can recognize faces or we can recognize a friend like from behind 150 feet down the street, that same recognition takes place for wildlife, for plants. And over time, those plants that we've planted are inviting us to be caretakers and to get to know them as people as it were, and you will get to know which your plants and which your weeds are. But the reason why this is not a soundbite answer is this is a long process for an individual, but most of all, it's a long cultural process. But let me give you this. If you can go into the supermarket and like tell the difference between, I don't know, kale and lettuce, or you can tell the difference between a peach and a nectarine, you're doing some high level taxonomy. You're telling a peach, which is, you know, pubescent versus a nectarine, which is, uh, you know, it's glabrous. You already are a botanist, you know, but you just don't know what to look at necessarily. There are great resources, but part of it is time and yeah, I mean, resources, go on a hike with people who know, get Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, take a class on how to use it or figure out how to use it, and just pick stuff off as it comes up. So it can be overwhelming. You're looking at all these plants, but the cool thing is they phase themselves seasonally. So just something new came into flower. What is this flower? It's most ID, easy to ID plants when they're in flower anyway, so wait for it to bloom, get to know it. If you're looking at it and flipping through the field guide and trying to answer all those confusing field guide questions, that may be aggravating, but it's forcing you to look. And it's forcing you to look at characters about plants that you otherwise wouldn't look. And if you let yourself over time, if you see something flowering in your garden and a week later you go on a hike and you're just starting to see that in the woods, you're like, hey, that's spice bush over there, one of the first flowers of spring. And your friends are like, oh, yeah, huh? how'd you know that? Because your home and the wild became more similar all of a sudden because you got spice bush in both places. I hope that's helpful. I, I grew up a city kid. I didn't know the difference between an oak and a maple. I thought going for a hike was like walking down to Chinatown and getting roast pork buns. If I can do it, so can you. Okay. Uh, a related question is, are there, are there any good books you can, I mean, you mentioned one uh, that you can reference regarding medicinal plants and uses and how to prepare them. Yes, there are some really good resources. And I probably should have thought about these in advance, but off the cuff. Um, there's a great book called Planting the Future about native medicinal plants. And it is not necessarily a restoration book, but it is a it is a book about gardening and planting with these plants and about um, restoring them and being less dependent on wild plant populations through an organization called United Plant Savers, which is a wonderful organization as well, Plant in the Future. Foraging wise, I highly recommend all the foraging books by Samuel Thayer. Um, they're self-published, but if you look up Foragers Press, uh, he's got three books out and he's a great botanist. He's a fantastic story player. Tell her the books are like these big stories about each plant. They're really fun to read. I really recommend those. Um, that's a good part, a good start. There are databases online. You know, there's like um, Green Dean has some stuff. You'll find stuff on Google and you're just going to have to put on your, your internet filter in terms of what quality information is. But, you know, as you're getting into these plants, especially if you're going to eat them and harvest them, it's important to look at multiple sources anyway 
to try to ascertain what your comfort level is and what the correct way to prepare stuff is. So it's good to build up these resources over time. Now, those would be a decent place to start. I, I have this guy that I've had forever. Um, it, of course, you're reading it backwards. It's the field guide to medicinal plants by Bradford Angier, Angier who also yeah. did field guide to edible wild plants that I sort of grew up on. I don't know if it's been superseded by uh, a better understanding. But you know, I actually don't have that book and haven't read it, so I can't speak to it. I know it's a classic, but um, I, don't, well, I don't know that. I don't know the details. I think we gave this person some uh, good stuff to go on. I see somebody asking Sam Samuel Thayer Forger Press. It's Samuel Thayer T H A Y E R, and uh, just you know, a fantastic writer and forger. Really lives it. Uh, Jared, could you talk about the resilience of native plants communities and how they compete in different ecosystems with invasives or, or, or even non-invasive non species? I think when I ask myself questions like this, I start asking questions about context. And there's a couple of different contexts. If you will, there's sort of like a chronological context and a spatial context for a wild habitat. So chronologically, like what happened here before? Was this, um, you know, eroded or abused farmland that is coming back with whatever can deal with those conditions? Is this a wild habitat that is part of like a large block of unfragmented core forest that has ample wildlife species and seed sources, were those relationships we were talking about are intact? If so, wild plant communities can be incredibly resilient. I mean, they made it back up from refugia down in the Carolinas from the last glaciation, which basically wiped the Northeast, you know, north of here clean in less than 10,000 years. And that's well, on a geological plant time scale. That's pretty fucking epic. But if you catalog impacts like what's happened in the groundwater here what's all the deer overbrows this is like a five acre parcel surrounded by suburbia and it used to be a farm until 19 you know 55 or whatever i think you start uh getting a contextual understanding for why invasive species might be really prevalent and problematic in some areas and have less of a hold in others and then that asks us the questions about um how do we use and exploit landscapes? How can we, who are like a very active disturbance oriented creatures, how can we funnel our disturbance in ways that are more beneficial to plant communities? What do we do about things like power line cuts and roadsides and so on that can be very disturbed areas, but also can be really cool, diverse areas. And I can't give you like an overarching generalization answer, but what I can say is like, start asking questions about what is this landscape telling you? I feel like plants always tell the truth in some way. That assemblage of plants, that community is telling you something about the history of that site, about the land use history, and about the context of that site too, within the broader landscape. Okay. We spoke briefly before we started here about a movement, a social movement towards a greater interest in native species and this idea of environmental restoration. Is there anything you can add to that thought? And what resources are out there for people interested in learning more about what is native to their region, uh, particularly in medicinal herbs? So uh, that's sort of two questions. I'm going to ask you to parse the first part of it again for me after I try to answer the second part. But in order to figure out what is your native to your area, there are some good resources. Um, one of them is called BONAP. This is a website. It's B-O-N-A-P or the Biota of North America Project. I think it's at bonap.org. And they have range maps for every species in North America. Uh, the USDA plants database, literally USDA P-L-A-N-T-S, also shows range maps for plants. So if you want to ask a question about a particular plant, you can go there and look it up. If you want to understand more like background, like what's native to my area, um, you know, I think it's partially 
ask other people who may know, um, look at your local, uh, there are a lot of good organizations putting out lists, put it that way. There's the Jersey Yards website. Um, there are native plant nurseries. And then there are more nuanced questions within that. So there's stuff that's native to New Jersey, but maybe they're Pines Barren specialists and they're not terribly relevant if you live on shale in the Piedmont, uh, you know, over the Delaware River or something like that. Or, you know, maybe they are. Um, and those can seem like daunting questions, but I also feel like they're exciting questions. They immerse you in this detective story about like, right. what was my area really like? Or maybe you can go find your own reference ecosystem. So that idea I talked about in the presentation coming from the Society for Ecological Restoration, coming from restoration practice where maybe we've got our yard or degraded, you know, little parcel of woods in the neighborhood park, but maybe you know that there's like a really beautiful hike nearby. And how do you know that that's healthy? How do you know that it's native? You don't necessarily, but I would submit that if there's flowering someplace from earliest spring to the end of fall all the way through, you probably have a diverse and possibly intact native site. I know that is such a shortcut, but that's my best idea for like, how could you just soundbite, am I in a healthy place? Prove me wrong, let me know, that's totally cool. Um, but that's the best I've come up with. What was the first question, okay, first part of the question? Back, get back to the first part of the question. Is Is there, a social movement that you see, whether locally or larger than that, um, about centered around ecological re restoration? Are there organizations, are there clubs, are there um, um, academic pursuits? Are there good universities or colleges? The United Nations just declared 2021 to 2030 or whatever the, the decade of ecological restoration. It's clearly in the zeitgeist in some substantial ways. And at the same time, I feel like it hasn't necessarily percolated to the community level in the same way that other aspects of the native plant movement or environmentalism have. And um, I think I really, really respect the Society for Ecological Restoration. I think that's more on the academic professional end of the spectrum, but uh, they curate a lot of resources, some of which may be relevant to just about anybody. Um, there are increasingly university programs in restoration ecology and so on, but at a grassroots level, it's like we have all these local land trusts and local nature preservation organizations that I think had a really strong conservation mission. I'm meaning like a really strong like land acquisition, land protection mission and are now moving into a stewardship era. And I think in tandem and in conversation with these organizations, you can both nudge them in stewardship directions and support them when they hire like a you know a part-time field steward or a director of land stewardship or whatever because ultimately this is all a community project right like if we can make connections to each other and share knowledge and share mistakes and share lessons learned this is such a young art such a young science we're not really going to go anywhere with it so most important is find the others okay now, uh, Zach has indicated last question, okay, but last I, question. I don't know. I don't know which one it is. Ah. Um, uh, do Do you have a position or advice on sustainable foraging, and are there rules or etiquette to consider? I, I guess especially on public land. Um. I think that there could be rules generated, but what's generating those rules is uh, what kind of life history does that plant have? Like, what is its context? And to move from the abstract to somewhat more detailed, some plants you're harvesting the root. And if you're harvesting the root of a plant, this may be a killing harvest, right? because you're digging it up and you're eating it, like maybe that Indian cucumber root. On the other hand, there are plants where you're consuming below ground um, portions of the plant, but they're rhizomes and they spread and they divide and they're colonial. And by digging up an area and disturbing the plants around it, you might actually be um, benefiting that plant, like the sweetgrass was benefited or like something like 
ground nut or Jerusalem artichoke come to mind as Pan said. Probably don't mind you getting in there and digging out some tubers or corms or whatever it is with that species. So are there rules? I mean, the rule is really like, I'm sure there's many that aren't coming to mind regarding safety and so on, but um, ask permission, you know, ask permission in whatever language you feel is appropriate asking that plant. And if you feel like you're not getting an answer like in English from the plant fairies, which you might not, I don't, you need to figure out another way to ask that permission, whether it involves research or asking somebody who knows, or really like sitting with that plant and understanding how big is this population? Yeah, I want to try ramps, but everybody's been in here digging up all the bulbs. Oh, I can eat the foliage when it's about to go dormant anyway, because it's a spring ephemeral and it tastes just as good. Why don't I just go and try ramps as a foliage plant instead of as a bulb plant? So I hope this is not a wishy-washy answer, but you know, really getting to know each plant. That's like part of knowing is half the battle, you know, like that's part of the adventure here is like the plants are inviting you to eat them, but the eating is inviting you to get to know the plants. And that's the circle that I'm trying to close with this presentation is like, how do we come good botanists? Because we don't want to eat something poisonous and off ourselves. So we're going to get to know to recognize it. How do we become responsible foragers? because we want to come back and forge again, but also because maybe we learned something about that plant where all of a sudden like we care because, oh, I, you know, I had a stomach ache and I had some bee bomb and I felt better or my kid was sick and had a light fever and had some elderberry tea and they were no longer all curled up and bunched and angry and red, but they fell asleep and I got some sleep that night. And like, you feel that interdependence, you feel that reciprocity, you're like, thank you. I will get to know you. I will listen in the future to Bebon because you saved my ass. And I, I guess if you feel like you're stealing something and uh, may, maybe you should listen to that as well and, and, and be your guide. Yeah, on, I think it's a whole nother conversation about what would foraging look like on public lands? Could there be something like game laws for foraging? Would that be good? Would that be bad? Um, can you go and harvest berries freely like in a state park? I, I think so. Um, can you go dig stuff up? No. Um, I think it's a whole nother conversation. And I don't, I'm not prepared to like delve into that. Um, but Fair ideally, enough. ideally, you know, we would be in our habitat and we would be reciprocal enough with these places that there would no longer be the sense of like, oh, you want and ate some berries and you're like stealing from the birds or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jared. As always, it's it's informative and fun and I learn a lot. I hope we can figure out another topic soon that we could have you again. Um, and um, I'm still looking for that party uh, once we get past this, um, this uh, hibernation period we're all forced into and we can get outside again and, and, and all of us be together. Very, wanna... much, very much so. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on and thanks everybody who joined this presentation. I wish I could, I wish I could see and interact with you all, but I uh, appreciate your presence even in the chat sidebar. So good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. This presentation was brought to you by the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Our mission is to advocate for the protection of the natural and cultural resources of the New Jersey Highlands region. Support us in accomplishing our mission by joining us, which you can do at our website, njhighlandscoalition.org. And thank God we abbreviate New Jersey. Have a good night. We'll see you soon.